Okay, and just to ground everybody in what this video is, this is the workshop on submitting your creative work. So, Love that, Lindsay. Okay. So if you just joined us, here's a copy of the agenda. Um, there's a link that um, Professor Becky will put in to the chat so you can access it as well. Um, again, feel free to pop questions in the chat at any time or use the hand raise tool if you wanna unmute and ask the question. So we wanna take about five minutes to have you write down any and all reasons you can think of for submitting your writing for publication. And you won't have to share this unless you want to in the chat, but just write pen to paper or open up a doc on your computer and just get those reasons for yourself down. So why don't you take one more minute to get to a good stopping place? And if you'd like to share um, one reason in the chat, you can feel free to do that. Okay, again, if you'd like to share one of your reasons in the chat, I think it's nice to see what other people are thinking around this. You might be feeling fear when you think about the idea of sending out your work for publication. Here's the truth. You will be rejected. If you're like me, you'll be rejected many, many times. It's part of being, re the, being a writer and while the fear of rejection might stop you from submitting work, might stop you from continuing to write, we're here today to urge you to embrace that rejection. 
it helps to remember that in many ways, rejections are out of your hands. If, you've know, if you know that you've created the strongest possible work you're able to um, at any given time, then rejections may mean that you just haven't found the right home for the piece. All you need to find is one editor who believes in that piece, but you won't find that person unless you keep sending out your work. Every time I hit submit, and this started when I was a grant writer, any time I would send out a grant, and now I do it with submissions, I say to myself, you got to be in it to win it. So you can have that mantra to um, help you through the submission worries if you want it. So you might get boilerplate rejections, and that's okay. Editors are super busy people, and that's how many of them handle high volume of submissions. But you might get a rejection with an encouraging note. And I want you to take refuge in this type of rejection. Maybe the editor has said the piece just needs a little more work, or maybe they've said they'd welcome seeing additional work by you. This piece just isn't quite right for them. Those kind of rejections means you are closing in on it. Celebrate those. In fact, I want you to shift your mindset and challenge you. I'm going to challenge you all to get your first 100 rejections by this time next year. This means every rejection is a reason to celebrate. You're getting closer to that goal. And if your work gets published, that's not a bad thing. Okay, you're, it doesn't get you closer to your rejection goal, but hey, you're getting published and we love that for you. So we're, we want you to celebrate both of these and we want you to flip the script on your expectations around publication. So the first step in getting published, of course, is to write and revise. I know for me, I have a hard time saying something's done and it's time to send it out. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got was from one of our alums, David Walker, who's the founder and editor of Goldman Walkman Journal. He shared this at a re reading a few years ago that he did at Westfield. And he said, I don't revise endlessly. And I was like, what? Am I the only one who does this? And what he explained is that he strives to get, he's a poet, so he strives to get a poem in good shape quickly with a few rounds of revision and then begins to send it out. When he gets five rejections, then he goes and revises the poem again. So he gets it in the best shape he can do at the giving moment and then goes for that, um, that goal of five rejections equals a revision. So that's one approach that you can, you can take. But really, you got to have the work written. You have to get in there, revise your work, and get it, get it out. So Becky's going to talk to you about finding places to submit, preparing your submissions, and writing your cover letter. Thanks, Beverly. I was going to share. Uh, first, I was trying to find my own submission um, list to where I, I keep outside of my tracker, um, my rejections. And the most I've ever gotten for rejections, I've never made it to 100, but I made it to 69 in 2018. <laughs> so I had 100 submissions, 107 submissions, but 69 rejections is the closest I've gotten. Um, so thank you so much, Beverly. There are so many places to submit um, and find, it, what you wanna do is find places that you can um, look for lists of places to submit within those. So uh, we have a few here, Submittable, Entropy, and Trish Hopkinson's uh, Selfish Poet blog. I really don't know why she calls it a Selfish Poet blog, because I think she's a really generous poet who's uh, sharing a lot of things with her literary community. So Submittable might be uh, familiar to you. It's a platform that's used by many publications to accept submissions. And as a submitter, it's free for you to create a submittable account. Um, you should do this if you haven't done it already, since so many places use submittable to accept work. So you'll be able to have all of your information just autofill when you're doing submissions. Um, within submittable, there's something called the discover tool. And there's a link to this in your agenda. Um, there you can search for open submission calls based on keywords, um, deadlines, fees versus um, fee submissions versus free submissions. And you can also follow places here to keep them on your radar. 
And when you submit using Submittable, they keep track of your submissions on their platform. So that is one way where you can go back and see all of the things that you've submitted using Submittable. But this can't really be your only form of tracking because not all places use Submittable. It does cost money to um, be a publication and subscribe to Submittable for your submitters. Um, the next place I wanted to tell you about was Entropy. It's an online magazine, but it's so much more. It's really a community literary space. They have a where to submit tab and it has new content every three months. So the list is organized by presses, um, meaning places that publish full length books, chat books, journals and anthologies and fellowships. So I recommend you checking out the journals and anthologies tab. You really wanna start out by looking for places to publish individual poems um, versus trying to publish a chat book all at once. That would be my, my recommendation to kind of build up um, individual publications. So there's a link in your agenda to the submit March, April, and May post that Entropy put out that we're, you know, we're almost into May now, which is Poetry Month. And they'll refresh that every three months. Uh, for Trish Hopkinson, I think Beverly is going to talk a little bit more about her site later, but she does have something that I wanted to mention um, just ahead of time, which is that she has a whole tab that is calls for submissions. So that's what's linked to in your agenda. And she really does focus on places where you don't have to pay to submit, which is what we want to encourage you to do, to not have to pay to submit your work as undergraduates. Um, her site is organized by type of poem, themed calls, paying and non-paying markets, but and that means markets that will pay you when you get published, which is rare, but that they do exist. Um, and then calls based on the identity of the writer. There's so much more there, so have fun in exploring that. Uh, new Pages is news information and guides to literary magazines, independent publishers, creative writing programs. So for those of you who want to think about going in a direction of an MFA, um, alternative periodicals, indie bookstores, writing contests, and more. So they have a tab that is called Calls and Contests, and that's in your agenda. Um, Poets and Writers Magazine, there are lots of resources there, including um, the most recent one, most useful one for you is the listing of literary magazines. Again, those are places that would publish independent pieces. So po poems, um, a short story, a short piece of creative nonfiction. And um, you can sort, sort the search to suit your needs in terms of um, several different um, areas there. And then Allison Joseph, she's another literary citizen heroine of mine, along with Trish Hopkinson. Um, she started something called Creative Writing Opportunities. It's C-R-W-R-O-P-P-S. It's a curated list of opportunities for creative writers. And it's not, yeah, it's not just poetry, it's fiction and nonfiction as well. And um, she just does this out of the goodness of her heart. She's a professor um, of, at Southern Illinois University and a very prolific poet. Um, another general tip that I wanted to just give you, which someone once gave me, was to, to mention that once you find your poetry rock stars, so those people whose work you love, um, the people whose books you want to buy. Um, if you can look in those books and you, you can go to the library and get the books as well, but the people who you just wanna have on your shelf, even if you're borrowing the book for a month, um, the, the books that you wanna read over and over. If you go inside those books, you'll find acknowledgements pages, meaning they will acknowledge where their pieces were individually published before they were published in a book. And it'll tell you where, which journals those poems were published in. And so if it's someone that you admire, especially if it's someone who you feel like is simpatico with you in your writing style, you can kind of use that as a dream list of journals to shoot for, um, for yourself. So that's another way to find places to submit. And um, poet and editor Katie Manning, she, she runs an, a publication called Whale Road Review. And she uses a Hansel and Gretel allusion to talk about this idea. She says, follow the breadcrumb trails left by poets who seem to be your kindred spirits by looking at the acknowledgement pages of their books and submitting to the same journals that published them. 
So I'm not alone with that idea and I didn't think of it. Someone else gave that to me, but that's that's a gift to you today. Becky, can I add on to that as Please. well? So, um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about poetry and um, poetry collections, chapbooks, when we're talking about this acknowledgements page, but this goes for you if you are a novelist, this is a terrific way to find um, an agent that might be interested in your piece. So if you look at um, one of my professors in graduate school always called them your narrative relatives. So what are you, what would sit next to your book on the bookshelf? Who would be its cousin? Who is it similar to? Look in those books in the same area, the acknowledgements, and boy, oh boy, if some writer gets published and doesn't acknowledge their agent, oof, I think they're in trouble. <laughs> so you're most likely will find that agent and then you can write down that name, look them up, find out what agency they're with. And that gives you um, a good starting point. And also with short story collections, you can see where writers of short stories are publishing in the same way and follow those breadcrumb trails as well. Thank you so much. I know I'm rather poetry centered around this um, right now because I'm teaching the poetry class, but I thank you for calling me on that because I wanna be more expansive. All of these places have um, ways of searching for all different kinds of writing. Um, thank you. So then preparing for submitting. Um, first of all, reading journals online and in print. So at Westfield, often your professors will have, um, I think at HCC probably too, uh, we'll have a plethora of in print literary magazines that we would love to put into your hands um, to borrow or take away. And obviously we're virtual right now, but luckily enough, there's a, a ton of online journals as well. Um, that can be resources for you. And you want to find where your work fits. And that's that's a hard thing to figure out. But that once you find um, places that your work fits, sometimes it's having peers who have been published in the same place or reading something that you feel like really sounds like your work, um, a, a style or a, maybe a topic or a theme that a place tends to like to publish, um, trying to target your publications to a a venue is a great idea. Um, so finding where your work fits and then thinking about formatting your submission. So you've found a bunch of calls for submissions, you've narrowed that down to where you think your work is going to fit and then you need to get ready to submit your work. Um, formatting, I would say the most important thing is paying close attention to the guidelines that the literary magazine or journal has for your submission. Um, because guidelines really differ from publication to publication. So you might have one place that asks you to submit through Submittable and there's a cover letter and you have to submit as a PDF. And then you might have another place that asks you to submit to an email address because they don't have the money to subscribe to Submittable and you have to submit it as a Word doc, not a PDF. Um, so it, you just have to be really careful and get used to reading for each um, individual journals expectations. Um, really your work can be ignored um, and not opened if you don't follow those directions and that that's a real shame because it really should be about the work. Um, so other than the strength of your work, the most important thing is following guidelines. So for poetry um, and maybe Beverly, if there's anything in particular that's for prose, um, I'm, I'm usually submitting poetry and you're welcome to add to this if you have other things. Poetry is often single spaced, that's an expectation. Poems should appear on their own pages. So if you have a short poem, it should be by itself. You don't wanna start the other poem on that page. That's a very typical expectation. Um, your name and contact should be on each page if it's not an anonymous submission. So if you're submitting to a contest, they will tell you to submit anonymously so that they can read without knowing your identity. And um, that's a matter of fairness and they might throw your, um, not throw it out, but they might ignore your submission if you don't follow those guidelines because they can't be impartial if they know your identity. Um, funky fonts, this is something I wanted to mention. And I think this goes for probably poetry and any other genre. Um, I've had some really great poems submitted in my poetry workshop this semester where students are playing with font 
And I think font can embody an emotion and it can be really fun to play with on the page, but this is not something you want to do when you're submitting your work. You really wanna have sort of a, a basic font, probably something like Times New Roman. Garamond might be about as funky as you wanna get with your font. Um, it just does, it's not, it's not a good look. You want your work to speak for itself. Um, and so unfortunately that's not something that you can really get too creative with um, when you're submitting. Um, that does not go for form. You can be, in, you can have interesting format, but um, font is something that you wanna be careful with. So don't make a statement with that. Is there anything Beverly that is for prose that you'd wanna add? Um, I'll say that you wanna make sure you, especially if you're using dialogue, you wanna make sure that you know how to format dialogue. And the best way to check yourself is to open up a book from your bookshelf that um, has dialogue and see how they're doing it. But um, I, you know, I forgot to put it on this agenda, but I will dig up. I have a great worksheet on formatting dialogue that I'll, I'll add to that for you all. So check back on, on the agenda in a, in a day or two and I'll have found it and put it on there. But I've also uh, added a link for the formatting of prose, um, just the stickler things like what size margins should you have? Where does your name go? Um, usually in prose, most places will ask for a word count. Um, so all of that information is, is linked to in the um, agenda. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Yeah, and so the, those are at the end of the agenda and there is a poetry link there, um, how to format fiction and how to format poetry. Um, and I just wanted to talk about that poetry manuscript formatting if you were to check that link out from the um, agenda. So that has one thing that I don't, I've never done when I've been submitting my work, which is to put the number of lines that is in the poem. Um, so that's not something I've seen before. Obviously, if a place asks you to do that, please do that. But other than that, this looks pretty similar to what you would submit. You'd have your name and um, contact information on each page, unless it was supposed to be anonymous, and then um, single spaced pages. And one thing that's really handy about the proper manuscript format poetry link is that it does show you what to do with a poem that is more than one page long. So um, there's a way to write continuing a stanza if it goes on to more than one page. So that's definitely something you want to check out if you have long poems. So let me just go back to my page. So that's formatting. Um, really, many journals are just very explicit about what they want. So it's just a, a matter of carefully reading. And then the next thing would be writing a cover letter. Um, it is important, but my thought is that it really should be very simple. And so um, I gave you a sample cover letter. Um, thank you, Beverly. Um, we'll just go to that next slide there with the sample one. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, so basically I just say, dear editors, um, there, there is a link in your agenda as well to this. And it, it's, they're more, the that one is more, they're more of a sticklers about this than I am. Um, I usually say, dear editors, unless I know the person maybe personally, or I'm clear that there's one person who's reading, I think often there's a team of people reading and I like to include everyone. So I don't just wanna put the editor in chief because that person probably actually isn't reading my submission in from the slush pile. It might be somebody else. So that's, I sort of feel like dear editors is a catch all. That's my personal thought, um, but a specific name if you can find it and you know that they're reading. So I would just say, I love the, your journal, <laughs> add the name of the journal. I was happy to see your call for submissions and your distance issue on poems written in response to isolation during the pandemic. I'm submitting three poems for this themed call, poem title number one, poem title number two, and poem title number three. And then you wanna add your bio, which is a short bio. And uh, Beverly will be talking about kind of what to put in your bio, especially as a fledgling writer and, um, what you can add there. And then just thank you for reading my work sincerely and your name. So I don't go on and on there in the cover letter. And I did wanna mention in terms of the cover le letter that the link that's in the agenda, I wanted to keep that in there because I think it's helpful to talk about both what, what not to do and to have a sample format of what to do. 
So I do think that there are some great things in that link, the perfect cover letter. Um, one of them that I thought was, is, again, is something I've never done, is to describe your piece. And that might be different for prose than it is for poetry. There's sort of an expectation that your piece will stand on its own and it doesn't necessarily need description. And so in, in workshop, we give each other descriptions and we have that opportunity, but um, the, I've never had that come up in a cover letter before. So um, word count is not something I ever add. Um, description is not something I add, but then the rest of that is. And then there's the idea of simultaneous submissions, which I just wanted to quickly touch on. Um, simultaneous submissions means if you're sending your poem to more than one publication at the same time. And most places really accept work that way. It didn't used to be that way. You'd have to send one thing out, wait for your rejection, which it usually is a rejection, <laughs> to come back and then send it out again. Um, now most places really accept and embrace simultaneous submissions. And the expectation is just, if you get accepted somewhere, please tell the other places that you've sent that piece or pieces as soon as possible so that they don't keep considering your work and taking their time to do that. And then they might accept it later as well if it's a strong piece and they would be disappointed to know that you had already accepted someplace else. So that's just kind of being a good um, literary citizen. So those are my thoughts on cover letters. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to just um, speak to the prose and um, the, the link that we have in the agenda, that's from Jane Friedman's website, although she didn't write it, uh, another editor did. And um, usually in, in prose, you do want to put the word count because they want to know right away, do they have the space in their journal? Mm -hmm. And um, I, was a, I was on the board of a, my graduate school journal and there was a piece that I just loved, but it was super duper long. And our editor kept saying to me, you can't keep fighting for this piece. We don't have enough room for it. And I said, but have you read it? And he said, no, I saw the word count and I knew we couldn't put it in. So, um, you know, those are the kinds of considerations that editors are sometimes thinking about. Like, do we, can we actually dedicate this many pages to this piece? They'll often tell you what the word count limit is. Um, so part of it is just kind of helpful to check for yourself like, oh, this is 8,000 words and they said no more than 5,000, maybe not the right venue for it. So I would put that in. And um, I don't think it hurts to put a, a one sentence kind of log line that just summarizes what your, your piece is about. But if, if you don't do that, I don't think it's going to harm you either. So I, I feel like that is optional, although not something you would do for poetry. I thought we would talk about writing your bio next. And I believe we have enough time for you to maybe jot this down, you know, like do, do a little writing. So I chose a crumpled paper um, picture for this because I feel like anytime I have to write a bio, I mean, I, now I use kind of the same one and tweak it. But early on, I just was like, what am I supposed to put in? And it felt like I was just trying over and over to get it right. So um, it doesn't have to be that hard. So there are some really simple things you should do in your bio. Put your name and you're gonna write it in the third person, your education, your profession if you are um, out of school, your location and publications. If you don't have any publications, that's okay. So again, you're writing this in third person. So I made up somebody who's sending out um, their bio and it just says, Jane Dower is an undergraduate studying biology at Westfield State University in Western Massachusetts. So that's somebody we can imagine is living on campus. So that's what they're saying. So really, really simple. You will see, um, you will see advice in different places that says, don't necessarily talk about being an undergraduate. The journals, the journal lists that we're providing for you all are targeted for undergraduates. So you would want to make sure that you are saying you're an undergraduate. You wanna be truthful. You don't wanna ever lie. 
but you can select what information you are putting in your bio. So if you are submitting to a journal that's for anybody, not just undergraduate students, and you feel like that might put somebody off, like they might say, oh, that writer's too young, I'm not gonna consider it, then leave it off, that's all. So why don't you take a minute and jot down your bio, thinking about name. Here, I'm gonna paste this in the chat. I just added what I could as you were speaking it. Oh, thanks. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so I'll just give you a minute or two to jot, jot something down and at least you'll have a starting point for your bio. And if anybody wants to share what they wrote in the chat, we'd love to see it. I guess I might add if you're if you're not out of school, like all of you right now aren't, um, when you're talking about your education, I think in, in Beverly, in your example, um, it was an undergraduate studying biology. So if you know what your profession is going to be, you, you know, you could write about your potential, you know, hope, hoping to pursue a career in or something like that. Um, so Lindsay, usually, yes, you might say, so for instance, I talk about my highest level degree and I think Becky does the same thing. You might say um, that you're a graduate from the English program at, we at Westfield State University. Um, I say I'm, um, that I hold an MFA from University of New Mexico. So just a statement like that. I will say that, you know, this is the basic bio, you will find some places that will really kind of encourage and ask for a create more creative bio, maybe something that lets you have fun with your bio talks about your love for Marvel comics or the fact that you are the third sibling and you have a dog named something and you always wanted to go bungee jumping or something like that. Um, just thinking off the top of my head, but some places ask you to tell a little story. Um, you know, you don't, again, you don't really want to do that unless it's asked for, but you might find it, some journals are looking for having a little bit of fun with the bio, which is kind of cool. That's a good question, Abby. Um, Abby's wondering about whether you should include concentrations and minors or just a major to keep it simple. Um, I'm wondering if I mean, I think if your minor, I'm thinking if your minor is writing or is English, is like related to, to writing or to publishing or something like that, that might be really appropriate. Um, or if it's related to the, the call, um, or if it just adds a little depth and your, your bio is kind of short right now, um, you could have that in there. And that would be an example of something you might drop eventually if, as you add publications and you, you find your bio getting longer. Um, I don't know, Beverly, what do you think about that? I would agree with that. I would start from there. And then um, just like you might look for uh, an acknowledgements page in somebody's book to see where they publish, you might look at the bios at the place where you're submitting the work to see what are, what are people doing? You know, what do they seem to like for the bios? And you can use that as a model. And that's where you'll see maybe some of the more creative ones um, that you might be able to do to, to jazz your bio up. This is a really plain and simple, you can't go wrong with this one, start for your bio. Great, thank you. Does anybody need more 
I'll keep that. Does anybody need more time or want to share their bio um, in the chat or by unmuting? Um, I'll show mine. Thank um, you. Because I know about one of these. So what I just find is like Dominic Valentine is an undergrad student in um, computer user support at HEC in Holyoke. Like, you know, I just kind of followed that template. Yeah, and I would just put Holyoke comma Massachusetts. Yeah, I just because, put MA yeah. just to, yeah. you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You might even spell out, say the whole name of your college, Holyoke Community College. Right. Because around here, everybody knows HCC, but you might be submitting to a journal in California and they wouldn't know. Yeah, that's knows. correct about that, so. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. All right, I'm going to keep going. If anybody wants to share in the chat or maybe at the end, if you want to share, we'll, we'll save some time for that. So I just wanted to um, talk about a few last things around submissions, um, making the submissions. I want to reiterate what Professor Becky said, follow the instructions. They're giving them for a reason. It might not be clear to you what that reason is, but on their end, on the editor's end and on their editorial board's end, it's, it's something that matters to them. Nobody's gonna make you jump through hoops just to make you jump through hoops. Um, you know, you might see fees for submitting, but there are plenty of places to submit that don't charge anything. So if budget is a concern right now, focus on the ones that aren't charging anything. And then um, the last thing I want to urge you is to make submitting a regular part of your writing practice. So if you have, say, a daily half hour writing practice, you're a rock star, first of all. And second of all, you could take one of those days a week to say, I'm going to spend my half hour looking for places to submit, uh, writing my cover letter to each place. Um, making the actual submissions. And that way it becomes in kind of an inherent part of your writing practice. And that, that's, I think, very important to get to a place where it's as much a part of writing as putting pen to paper is. I would echo that. And also to say, if you're feeling stuck with writer's block, if, if that exists for you, um, a lot of people lately, if you went to last Thursday's reading, um, with the contemporary black women poets who came to Westfield, a couple of the poets were saying, I just don't believe in writer's block anymore. And one of the reasons is because there are so many other parts of your writing life that you can spend time on. So you can, you can have prompts and find ways to write, but you can also invest in another part of your writing life, which is the submission process. Thanks, Becky. Okay, so um, Becky alluded to the need to track your submissions. You need to know what you sent where, and partly you want to know that so you have a sense of which poems are out at which publications, but also so if you have done simultaneous submissions and something gets accepted, you know who to contact to let them know so that you can withdraw that, that piece from them. So um, I've got a link here and um, I'm gonna open this up to show you. And um, Becky, would you mind, I don't know if you're able to open that, if you could just um, put the link to it in the chat, just from the share button, if you wouldn't mind. So this is a database that, um, this is what I use and um, you can take this and adapt this. So I'm giving you this, this one as a sample so you can copy it and put it into your um, your drive. So I organize mine because I submit in a couple of different ways. So I submit poetry, I submit fiction, and I pitch ideas. So um, I have these tabs down at the bottom. And here's if, if I'm looking at an outlet, like say I'm reading um, Teen Vogue, and I'm like, oh, I think this would be a great idea to pitch to them. I can put down the information that I, that I know I'm going to need and I can write the pitch idea. So when I talk about pitching, you do that for articles. So that's more of a freelance kind of thing. Um, 
you don't do it for fiction, creative nonfiction or poetry typically. So um, when I want to write that pitch, I've got all the information I need right here and I can get that started. So then this tab pitches is um, for things that I've actually submitted. And then I just like to separate out fiction and poetry because I write and submit both. So it makes it a little easier for me to track. And you can see, I'm just putting the name of the piece. So when I say title right here, I'm talking about the title of what I'm sending. Um, if you wanna have just one database, you could keep genre right here. I use genre probably more in fiction. So if, if it's women's fiction, I might put that. If it's historical fiction, I might put that. Poetry, I don't know as though you need that. Um, what journal it is, when I submit it. I like to keep track of how they had me submit it and how much they charged. Um, I do track what I spend on my writing and what I make on my writing so that when I do my taxes, I can know what I can deduct from what I've made. Um, and if you ever wanna talk about that more, we can. Um, I don't know as though we have time tonight, but I'm happy to email with you about that. And then I put the date of the reply, what the response was and any notes. So usually what I put for notes is if the editor who sent me a rejection writes something nice, I wanna write what that is here. So I remember, oh, this is what they said about this poem. Okay. Let me get back to my slides. So I love that you're sharing your um, database, the simple database. I am sort of a Luddite. I don't really know how to create things on Excel. So I'm just really excited about using yours. Um, I do that for my, I do two different things. I use Duotrope, um, which is actually not something I recommend to you because you have to pay for it, but it is something that I use and I wanted you to, to know about it and maybe why not to use it right now. Um, and the other thing I do in addition to that is I keep a yearly, um, on a Word doc, sort of a list. So I have um, total submissions, total rejections, um, withdrawals, acceptances, and publications. And I have that color coded in my own way. And I kind of use that alongside Duotrope. Um, in terms of Duotrope, it is a submissions tracking tool. It costs $5 a month and $50 a year. So it's a little cheaper if you get a year long subscription. Um, there is a free trial, but it's only for a week. And so I don't really recommend this um, for trying it out because you have to, uh, you have to load your pieces into there and load your submissions in there. And it's a lot of work to put in I guess I kind of decided I wanted to just join rather than do the trial when I first joined because it's a lot of work to set it up. Um, and then it feels like, oh, all my stuff is on there and now I have to pay for it. So you might you might not wanna do that. Um, it, it might be something that you wanna try a free trial just to see what's on there for resources because maybe the resources would be worth it to you. Um, I've asked for it as a, a holiday present for a couple of years when I just couldn't think of something I really needed. And it was like, oh, please support my writing. So my stepmom gave that to me as a present for Christmas two years in a row. So that's, I mean, that was just how I, how I did it when I first got into it. Um, one thing that I want you to know that I have found helpful with Duotrope is their newsletter. And it is for members, but they send um, they send a whole call about like newly opened when a contest is just opened or a journal has a new open submission period. And one of the things in that newsletter is themed calls. And um, I have just gotten some luck with finding a themed call that is a match for me um, for something that I've already written. So when you're trying to publish things, it's really hard. It's a dartboard and you're gonna try and um, experience rejection as part of that process. And so to kind of narrow down the possibility um, to have your darts of your pieces go more toward that bullseye, if you can find a themed call, which is what my sample cover letter referenced, you know, if when I look at my duotrope list, it has, um, poems about Black Lives Matter or poems about the pandemic or poems about being Asian American, poems about gun violence. 
And sometimes I'll see some poems about the moon and it's like, oh, I've got this poem about the moon and I can send it there. And so it just feels a little more targeted. Um, so again, that's not something you have access to, um, but I do. <laughs> so um, I could share it somehow with you or um, it is a little perk of duotrope, but just kind of keeping in mind themed ideas. And I think you can find that in other places. You can find that um, probably on Trish Hopkinson's blog because she's amazing. Um, a little bit on the discovery tool of submittable. So even if you can't subscribe to Duotrope, looking at themed calls is helpful. Thank you. All right, so these resources, and I think we've added a few more, are on the um, agenda. And we've got a couple of different sites. Um, one is actually a list of journals that in accept undergrad work that a colleague at another institution had put together and is allowing us to use. The other is, um, I think, a website. There might be crossover between A and B, but I don't think that's going to hurt you <laughs> to look through both. We've got a link to Trish Hopkinson. Um, it's a treasure trove. Her website, um, I link to just what she has to say about submissions. But her website is, if you're in one of my classes, it's labor log worthy to spend as much time as you want uh, navigating her website and seeing what you can learn from her. I've linked the sample submissions database there. And then um, Facebook is a great resource for calls for submissions. There is a group just called calls for submissions. And um, either you, you're welcome to friend either me or Professor Becky and either of us and just you know send a note saying I'd love to be invited to the call for submissions group and we'll make that happen for you. Um, or you can find it on your own if you want. All right, so I would love to hear what questions you have and you're welcome to unmute or pop them in the chat. I wonder if we should come back to not sharing screen so we can see each other as we talk. At the okay, end. well, I had one more slide that I'm going to show oh, then I'm and sorry. then we'll do that, Becky. So um, this is your challenge. I hope you'll take it up. Um, we just want to challenge you to get 100 rejections by this time next year. And truly, we want you to check in with us. Um, let us know every time you get a rejection and we will celebrate you with all the gusto we can muster. <laughs> all right, so questions, concerns, something that you need more information about. I'm also wondering if anyone has stories from the trenches of trying this already. Yeah, so yeah, who's been submitting, <laughs> Lindsay? Um, I don't know, or, uh, okay, I'll just say it. Any, I guess, more of advice for motivation to submit and write and all that stuff, because I'm the least motivated person in this world. I don't entirely believe that, Lindsay. Having had you as a student, I don't entirely believe you. Um, well, I guess the first thing I would do is say, what, um, what did you write when we had the free write at the beginning? What came up for you when you wrote about why you would want to submit? Is there anything that you're willing to share from that? Oh, I see yours in the chat to feel pride mm -hmm. and humility. So um, that would be my first thing to say, like let that desire to feel those things motivate you. Um, yeah. Becky, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I was scrolling back through the chat. Like, what did she say? What did she say? Um, so lack of motivation, that's what you talked about, right? Um, I think having a group to be responsible to, um, to share this, having a writing group. So we, we have that in our class right now, but submitting isn't really a, a part of that, except this is the, the extra thing we're doing but sharing it with other people. So um, Beverly and I are both in a group on Facebook where you can 
brag about your rejections <laughs> and um, brag about your acceptances. And that it's kind of, that's why we want you to share that with us because that kind of um, motivation to tell someone else who's a writer who gets it, I think can help. Um, and yeah, connecting to those, those ideas. So what, what do you wanna have out there in the world that you feel like isn't out there yet that would give you pride to be able to have your name on it? I'm curious about the humility, if that's um, because you know you're gonna experience rejection, so it's gonna give you that feeling. Yeah, why did, why did you put humility, Lindsay? I'm wondering, what's that connection? Uh, I guess I was just thinking of how they're kind of opposites, but they like honor and humility and pride and all that are kind of all connected and stuff and how you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. the yin and course. yang of it all. I'll tell you, Lindsay, I get motivated by, I love to have a goal. Like I am the project queen where if I turn something into a project, I'm all in. So whatever it is, like I'm all in. So the, the second I tell myself, okay, I want to get X number of rejections in this amount of time. For me, that's the motivation is I just love a project. So I think, um, you know, thinking about what, what would be a fun way for you to approach it might help motivate you too, like making it fun. And I, I have to echo what um, Professor Becky said, the, the community that you have is probably the biggest motivation because you can share with them, you know, okay, I'm gonna send out, you know, three poems in the next week and then check in with them in a week and let them know whether you accomplished it or not, that might help. Brennan, I know you've had your hand up. So tell us about your, your thoughts and questions. Um, I just wanted to say uh, last semester, I had to do advanced pros with Dr. Phyllis and we have the submit the submittable. I got rejected by it. So yeah, for my All novella, right. which I threw in the trash because I, I didn't, I don't write, I don't like writing prose. And even um, Dr. Orlander knows this professor. Um, I just don't, I'm more of a poetry writer, but also at the same time, I mean, I've gotten quoted by big companies, Marvel, DC, you know, for work on stuff that I love doing. I love writing video game reviews. I love writing TV reviews, but at the same time, I'm like getting my foot out there and, you know, it's just, why do I want people to listen to me? Kind of something like that. Nice. Yeah, thank you. I'm going out of the screen because I wanted to show you. Um, this is a book called All My People Are Elegies. It's written by Sean Thomas Doherty. And um, it's, uh, he, he's talking about, he's, it's after a furious, furious series of rejections from dozens of literary magazines, Doherty had had enough. He decided to fight back. Um, so this is him improvising in real time, a series of epistolary, which is letters um, epistolary public responses on Facebook over a six month period that began with Dear Editor. And then the edited result is this, this collection. Um, so if you're looking, if you don't have your, your own community, but you're looking for someone else to bond with, um, this is an interesting, an interesting book that takes rejection and turns it on its head by writing back to the editor. So that's also a good writing prompt too. <laughs> Just write, write back to the editors who, say whatever they have to say to you. But what are what are other folks wanna say or add about their, their questions or um, battle stories? Lindsay. Um, I guess it's more of a question for like submitting to poetry because I was kind of looking through some submissions and I found this one literary journal that seemed really interesting, but they had said that they don't, or it was like along the lines they don't look at poetry submissions that only have like one poem and so they is it more common to like submit like a group of poems or is it just kind of like one of those outlier things I'm not really sure yeah it really yeah. depends it depends on the place and the call um I just submitted a like three different things I uh one thing was a sort of a mini chat book that was an online a group of 10 poems and then I just it submitted to two different places that were looking for up to 10 poems. 
Um, and I feel like that's more outlier actually than, um, than typical, but it goes back to follow the directions. So if there are places that ask you for three to five and you don't wanna send them one. Um, yeah, so as Beverly's saying in the, in the chat, usually, usually three to five is what folks are looking for. Um, there are places that will accept just one, like a themed issue. And if you have one that's perfect for it, but that's, I think that'll have to do with following directions and doing that searching to find your right fit for your right piece. Yeah. It's helpful. Some advice I got when I first started sending out poems was to start thinking about the poems that I was writing and how they fit together. You know, so whether it was thematically or if I was using a form multiple times so that when I was sending a packet, the person who was talking to me, my mentor was saying, you know, you kind of up your chances of them taking more than one poem if thematically they're similar because they you know, it might appeal to them to see this, this theme brought through in a, in a few different ways. So that's something to think about too, is, is just looking for um, poems that seem related to each other somehow. Great um, Dominic, what, what would you like to say? Um, so this goes back to the bio thing, but like, for example, how would you, um, cause like I'm published in like one of the ACC's Pulp City things. So like, how would I quote that per se? Cause it's specific issue. So like, how would I say that publication? I mean, I usually say her work appears in and then the journal name. Okay. You know, so her work, you would say his work appears in, what was, you told, you wrote it in the chat, Pulp something, right? Yeah, Pulp City, it was fall 2020. The, uh, issue. Pulp City. Okay, so you, you, you could just have that, his work appears in Pulp City. Yeah, and you would not want to say, you don't need to say Pulp City issue three, number five. Okay. And you don't really want to say Pulp City HCC's publication. Yeah, yeah, you don't, yeah I get that. Um, because then you just, you get to say Pulp City and who knows what Pulp City is. That's, mm -hmm. it's a cool thing in Chicago. It's a cool thing in Holyoke. <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. Just to get back to that really quickly, try to find those journals that are looking, that are gonna celebrate you that you're an undergraduate, um, mm -hmm. you know, where you don't have to hide that. And it's actually, it's like looking for a themed call. You find the place that's looking for you and they want to publish an emerging voice that hasn't been heard before. And there are places like that, that Professor Beverly gave a link to and I, I put in the chat. All right. I wanna be mindful of your time. I am so appreciative that you spent this hour with us and I hope you take us up on our challenge of a hundred rejections. Let me know um, if you do. But um, as, we, as we say goodbye, if there are any last questions, feel free to unmute and, and ask away. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you thank everyone you. for being here. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.